We are very glad to be here this morning, glad to be able to come and just to worship, have another opportunity to stand and to proclaim the gospel, but because as each day passes, it's one less opportunity we have to share the gospel with those we come in contact with. But it's so good to, uh, to be here, to see you, uh, to be with God's people, to hear testimonies uh, of what God has done and what God's doing, and, but also cries out for help, cries out for, for, for the strength to make it through. We all need that. We all have to have that in this day and time. We all have to have that to make it through uh, the struggles of this life that we go through. And today we want to uh, share with you a passage of Scripture. It's very familiar. If you've got your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew 6, verse number 5. Uh, we've been going through uh, this thought that we had in our mind several, several weeks ago uh, about reminding, uh, putting reminders out. Uh, many of you uh, use post-it notes to remind yourselves to do certain things. Uh, on your phones, you can put a note there in them. Uh, you can even uh, have your phone remind you of that note, put a little alarm on the note or whatever. It's kind of a we, it seems we always need reminders in life of what's coming, what's happening, and this, that, and the other. Um, personally, myself, if, I, if you tell me something and I don't write it down, uh, there's probably a good chance I may forget it uh, because of all that's going on. And, uh, but I'm thankful that the Word of God is littered uh, throughout it with reminders of how good God is of how amazing He is, of how much He loves us, of His greatness, of His majesty, of His glory, and of His promises. Well, today we want to talk about prayer uh, for a few moments. Uh, prayer, as we understand it, is an offensive and defensive weapon that's given to each believer. It is. But it is often the least utilized weapon that we have in our arsenal. Now, you may try to wonder what the other weapons are. One of them is the Word of God. And if you look at the, the Scripture when uh, the Word of God is mentioned as being the sword of the Spirit, it references as a plural aspect. It's multiple weapons that the Word of God is. And we know the armor of God is there to protect us. But prayer works both ways. It's defensive. And it's also offensive. I don't mean offensive as far as bad, but it's offensive in pushing forward to accomplish something. We look at the early church in the book of Acts, and we see they seem to be constantly in prayer. Paul would later uh, write in 1 Thessalonians to verse 5, chapter 5, verse 17, was to pray without ceasing. Pray constantly. Pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean you're always on your knees at the altar praying? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that physically, but you're always in this state, this readiness of prayer. It reminds me of the Minutemen that were referenced in our history during the Revolutionary War. Uh, they were prepared in a moment's notice to go to battle. We as Christians, we as God's people, must be prepared at any moment to pray. We need to be in that state of readiness to pray. So this morning, uh, we want to talk about prayer. So if you will, please stand with me. We're going to read chapter 6, verse number 5 through 8 in your hearing. Stand and honor the Word of God with me, please. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 5, Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows what things you need 
before you ask him. Now, let's pray. Father, take your word today and accomplish what you want to with it. May you bless your people with it. May you encourage us. May you strengthen us. May you build us up. May you convict us if that's what we need. God, help us to learn more about prayer. Help us to be uh, more engaged in our prayer life. Forgive us when we don't pray. Forgive us when we go through the motions of prayer. Forgive us, Father, when we just don't think it's useful or not getting anything done. Help us to keep praying and keep trusting in you, Father, because you hear us. You love us and you care for us. Today, I pray, if there's anyone here lost, speak to them and hear their prayer when they call out to you to save them and save their souls. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. And amen. You may be seated this morning in all the word of God. May God bless it. We look at prayer, the reminder to pray. Do you need reminders to pray? Sometimes you do. Sometimes we all need reminders, of course, to do many things. But notice there's a reason to pray. There's a reason to pray. And the reason to pray is Jesus says here in verse 5, whenever you pray. He didn't say if. If you decide to pray today. No, he said whenever you you pray. Whenever you pray, there's a reason to. Jesus prayed as well. We see Jesus in the New Testament Gospels. We see him constantly going away and praying. We see him praying even the night he was betrayed and crucified, the next day. Prayer is a stop sign. I, mean, well, I love this analogy. A stop sign is not a suggestion. I hope you all know that. I've shared that numerous times here. But when you come to a stop sign, it means to literally stop. And look both ways before you pull out. Don't just do the rolling stop where you see nobody's coming and you just roll through the stop sign. It sets a bad example for my kids and your kids. Stop at the stop sign. I don't care if nobody's coming. Stop at the stop sign. Brandy told me her driver's ed teacher, if they didn't completely come to the stop sign, stop, stop at the stop sign, they had to get out and hug it. Rolling stops, you, made, you had to hug the stop sign. I, I, I'm just waiting. I catch you, one of you, catch one of you all, and I see you roll through the stop sign. I'm going to pull you over myself. Go hug that sign. Go hug it. Probably fire me the next day, but that'd be all right. It'd be funny. Prayer is not a suggestion. It's essential to the Christian faith. It's essential to our individual relationships with God. We must pray. We need prayer. What is prayer? The reason to prayer. pray. Prayer is how we communicate with God. We can't call him on the phone. Can't send him an email. Can't write him a letter. Well, you can do all those things. And God may send you a, a, a reply back in a letter. I don't know how he would do it, but he, if he so chose, he can. He's, I don't limit God in any shape, manner, or form. But God communicates with to us through prayer and his word. I find that when I am in a good state of prayer, anybody had a bad state of prayer? Where you just said the words and, and nothing was done, nothing happened, you didn't feel anything coming on it, and you just move on. Well, that's a useless prayer, and you just go on. But when I'm in a good state of prayer, I'm often, when I am praying, and my frame of mind and my soul is in tune to what God is saying, guess where I'm drawn? I'm drawn right to his word somewhere. Where what I might need that day, in that very moment, God's Holy Spirit directs me to the exact passage that I need. I may not have found that without first praying to him. Without first coming to him and praying and asking for help in that moment in time. Whenever you pray, 
As Paul wrote again, we mentioned earlier, we're to pray constantly. Be in a state of readiness to pray. Pray without ceasing. Don't get tired of prayer. I know we get tired of cleaning your houses. I know you get tired of, uh, of this and that and the other, doing things all the time, constantly. You know, in spring, it's great. I oh, mean, I can get out and start mowing the yard again because we've been stuck in, inside all winter. But by the time you know, August comes around, I mean, I got to mow the yard again. You know, it, it kind of gets, uh, prayer shouldn't be that way. Prayer should not be a burden to someone who claims to love Jesus Christ. Prayer should not be an obstacle that we have to set aside, every, throw everything else down because we've got to pray. i got to pray. We should desire to pray. We should desire in our hearts each day to have direct, intimate communication with God. Intimate. Notice it says, whenever you pray. Then in verse 6, but when you pray. There's a reason to it. There's a reason. The reason is it's essential for our walk, our daily walk with the Lord. If you didn't eat, to, if you don't eat today, your body's going to be hungry by the end, of, maybe now. If you didn't eat breakfast, you're probably hungry right now. If you skip lunch, you're going to get even hungrier. By the end of the, end of the day, you're going to be, as we call it in our house, hangry, you know? You're going to be hateful and rude to everybody because you're hungry. Go eat something and hush. When you don't pray, the reason why your walk with God gets cold is because you're not communicating with Him. You're not talking to Him. More important, you know prayer works both ways? You're not always having to speak. You listen as you pray as well. There's a reason to, because it's how we communicate with God. Our Father, the one who died for us, the one who loves us, the one who gave his life on the cross for us, that's how we communicate with him. Now, with you all, I can call you on the phone, I can text message you, we can talk out in the parking lot, we can talk in here. There's numerous ways that we can communicate with each other in our day and time. God's above all that. He's given us prayer and how intimate it is. How intimate it is. Now, we next look at the reason to pray. We now look at the practice of prayer. And I left my King James Bible in the, in the van. I was unloading other stuff, and it didn't get carried in, and that's all right. But in the King James Version, this is why I read this in verse 9. It says, you can quote this as well, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Huh? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The CSB reads a little bit differently, and I've not memorized that. I've memorized the King James Version of it. Some of you have memorized the NIV version of the Lord's Prayer. Some others have memorized other versions of the Lord's Prayer. It's all right. It's the model prayer. This gives us a practice of prayer. The reason and the practice of prayer. One of the first things we look at in the practice of prayer is we remember who we're talking to. Did your mom and dad ever tell you that? Anybody ever told you, your boss may told you, do you know who you're talking to? Now some people say it arrogantly, do you know who I am? And I may go, uh, no. I don't know who you are. But if I was speaking to my parents or my aunt and uncle or somebody in authority over me, I better know who they are in their position. I remember when we pray, I remember when I pray, when I pray who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to you when I pray. I'm talking to the Father. I'm talking to the creator of the universe when I pray. I have to remember that. Now, I'm to enter his courts with thanksgiving. I'm to enter his courts with praise according to the scriptures. I'm, I'm to enter his, his presence with confession of my sins. We'll look at it in a moment. 
But I'm remember who I'm praying to. He's God. I'm not. He's not some normal guy. He's the creator of the universe. He's holy. I'm not. You're not either. We're only holy and made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. I enter his presence, though. I'm able to. Prayer is an intimate time with God. Now, for those of you who are married, those of you who are, are, are dating, now I don't mean intimacy in, in a sexual way, in a statement, but you, you know if you're married or dating somebody, you know what intimate time is. Intimate time, where it's just the two of you. And there's nothing distracting going on. It's just the two of you together, experiencing the moment of time. And it may be just silence. Sometimes I'm telling you what, the most intimate times I have a brand new, brand new, there's nothing going on. It's just silence. Nobody's saying nothing. Nobody's around. And we're just quiet. It's intimate. Intimate. Sometimes that's intimate when we're driving to church and the kids are, are, are silent. They're not fussing each other or, or beating each other up or throwing stuff at each other. You know, they're not that bad. I'm just, I, I like extreme nature there. But, and everybody's quiet. There's nothing going on. I just hold our hands. Intimate time. Intimacy with God. It's a struggle sometimes, especially for, for men. Because we think of the word intimate and we're always, our brains work differently than women's do. Did you ever, knew that, didn't you? That men's minds work differently than women's do? I hope you all knew that. If you didn't, man, I've really shocked the world today, right? But men, my, men's minds, when we hear the word intimate or think of the word intimate, we're always drawn to the sexual aspects of what that word means. It's not always the case, though. Here, it's not the case with God. Intimate means personal. It means focused. It means genuine. It means that there's nothing that you want more in that moment than you and your communication with God Almighty. There's nothing else you want more in that moment. That's what prayer is supposed to be. Now, do you, do you see how hard that is to get? Do you see how hard that is to find in our busy society today? Because we always think, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to get this done, my day is all land out. If you have a planner and you go by that planner and there is no room for God in that planner that you have in your phone or in your desk, you need to chuck that planner out. Redo it, rewrite it, change it up. Put some time in there with God. Prayer should be done with as little and limited distractions as possible. So if you've got kids and you're trying to go to work, you're most likely not going to be able to pray while you're trying to get ready and get them out the door to go to school. If, if, if you're praying then, all you're really doing is praying, God help me, right? That's all you're getting out. Nothing that you can't, you can't think of anything else. You got your shoes on. You got socks on. You got your lunch, but you got this, you got that. You ain't going to be able to pray to God in that moment in time. Notice what he says in verse 6. But when you pray, go into your private room. Shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Go into that room. Shut the door. Put a no disturb sign. Do not disturb sign on the door. Upon penalty of death, knock on that door. Sign. I'm praying to God. Leave me alone. Unless the house is on fire, don't knock on the door, right? Unless the stove is on fire, don't knock on the door. Get some time where there's nothing else going on and spend time with your God. Now notice what you're able to do when you pray. When you pray, you go into your private room, you shut your door, and you pray to your fathers in secret. Where are you? Well, I'm in this room. You told me to go in, Paul. No, where are you? You are in the presence of God when you pray. How amazing is that? 
Me, you, who once were sinners and deserving of hell, are now allowed to come into the presence of God and talk with Him. That's prayer. That's how amazing it is. We can literally step into a room, block everything else out, and God be there with us. And we can talk with Him. We can commune with Him. We can tell Him everything going on. God, this world stinks. My life stinks right now. Everything is falling apart. I'm just falling apart, God. Will you help me? God's in the room with you because you're allowed into his presence. God, I've got this question. I've got this decision. God, I don't know what to do. What do I do? I'm about to panic here. God, help me. He's there. He's there. Anybody else get like that every now and then? Maybe you don't want to admit you do, but you've been there. If not, you probably will be one of these days. The practice of prayer. You go into his presence. He's waiting for you. That's the amazing thing about God. He's so patient. And he patiently waits for us to come to him. He's waiting for us to come. You don't have to book an appointment either. You know that? I know it's cliche, but I, I just think it's so important to say. You don't have to book an appointment to come before God Almighty. <laughs> He's waiting for you. He's got time for you. Now notice also the part of the price of prayer. You don't need to babble. You don't need to babble when you pray. What does babble mean? Repeat the same thing over and over and over and over again. It, when, when I talk to you and you talk to me, if you tell me the same thing over and over again, I'm going to tell you what. I heard it the first time. Notice what he says in verse 8. Don't be like them, those who babble, because your father knows what things you need before you ask him. Well, then why do I pray? If he already knows, why does he just give me what I need? It goes back to the intimacy of your relationship with God. If God gave you everything you needed without asking him for it, would you really have an intimate relationship with him? You'd have an expectant relationship with him, not an intimate one. We need to remind ourselves to pray. We need to remind ourselves that God has good things in store for us. That God wants to remind us where those good things come from. They don't just appear out of nowhere. They come from him. That's where the intimacy comes in. The intimacy is coming in. God, thank you for this that you have given me. Thank you for this that you have blessed me with because I know it's from you. Now, they're, they're down in the model prayer, the practice of it, a few things just to hit on this is you pray to honor the Father. You enter his presence, you pray to honor him. You pray for his provision. You pray for it, for him to provide you what you need that day. Give us today our daily bread, huh? You pray for his forgiveness. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Forgive us those who have trespassed against us. We for ask for his forgiveness. We ask for his protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We pray for his protection. Matthew 26, verse 41 as Jesus is praying there in the garden, he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit's willing. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm ready to do the will of God. I'm ready to be in his will. I'm ready to go praise his name. But the flesh doesn't want to do it. The flesh wants to, to do this and that and the other. The flesh wants to be angry. The flesh wants to partake of the world. The flesh loves sin. And too often times the flesh wins out. And we're left shattered shells of our former lives. Because we didn't pray. We threw prayer aside for worldly things. Had no room to pray. Or so we thought. So we replaced that time we didn't think we had for prayer with worldly things. And what happens? 
We're surprised when everything falls apart. We got no time to pray. There's a practice to pray. Those things we listed in there are things that we can use to do. You don't need to stand in the synagogues and the street corners to be seen by people. Nobody needs to hear you pray. I know we sing, I know there's been some old songs sung about when mama prayed. You may remember your mother praying, your father praying. You may have heard them pray. That's great. It's awesome. Remember that. Follow their example. But you don't have to, any, nobody has to hear you pray. The main point of that context, though, is that you shouldn't pray to be seen. I, I have been in serve, church services where someone is, is asked to pray, and, and that prayer is all about them. They are praying to be heard, or they're praying to be heard above the next person sitting next to them praying. Or they're praying to be the last one finished to say amen. I don't think God's glorified in that. I've, all, I, I've struggled with that my years. I say, okay, you've got 18 men here praying, and they're all praying as loud as they can. I know God hears them whether they're loud or whether they're silent. I think it just causes confusion. And that's just me. And I'm just speaking from my heart. It's just me. I think it causes confusion. Pray. You don't have to babble. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Those who pray to be seen, they've got the reward. They got Saul. Uh, yeah, I said it kind of weird, but they were seen praying. And that's their reward. Notice what it says. When you pray, you go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And guess what? And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Where do you want your rewards to come from? From man or from God? All the rewards that man gives us, guess what? They're wasted. They'll be wasted, left behind, given to somebody else, lost, destroyed. But all the rewards from God are what? They're eternal. They're eternal. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Why does it mention this? Here's how the Gentiles prayed in that day and time. That culture now, remember, you get into the time of the Romans, the Greeks, they would babble. They would say the same thing over and over and over again, trying to bend the will of their God to them. Well, I'm going to tell you a big back-breaking secret today. You can't bend God's will to yours. You can't do it. I don't care how much you pray, how great you are, how much scripture you memorize, you can't make God do what you want him to do. God's will will be done one way or another. We got the prime example of this in Jesus Christ, his son. As he's praying in the garden there in Matthew 26, he's praying, God, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, your will be done. Prayer is not to bend God's will to ours, it's to bend our will to His. That's what it's for. God, show me your will for my life. Show me your will for my family. God, show us your will for our church. Not what our will is. Because our will is usually polluted with sin. It's usually deceptive. It's usually selfish in nature. That's the practice of prayer. Now the effectiveness of prayer as we come to a close. Turn, if you will, to James chapter 5. Don't you hate it when you move your bookmarks? James chapter 5, we'll pick up in verse number 13. 
James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Wow! We should desire to have effective prayers. How do you have effective prayers? You've got to put in prayer into practice. You've got to remember who you're praying to. You've got to make it an intimate time with the Lord. It's something that needs to be done with as limited distractions as possible. Pray. Pray to honor God. Pray for Him to protect you. Pray for Him to provide for you. Pray for Him. To Him. To help you through each situation of your life. Because your flesh is weak. Your flesh is weak. And it gets weaker. The less you pray, the less strength you have to resist temptation. Because we look at prayer. Elijah prayed. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Is that not effective prayer? Huh? God told him to pray. And it would not rain for three years. Elijah went out and prayed. Guess what? It didn't rain for three and a half years. His prayer was effective because two things. Elijah was praying in the will of God. He didn't just, you know what, how can I get King Ahab today? How can I make King Ahab, that wasn't what Elijah was doing. I know what I'll do, I'll pray and it won't rain. That wasn't what Elijah was doing. God had put it in his heart to pray that it would not rain, to get Ahab's attention and the people of God's attention. Elijah went out praying it didn't rain for three and a half years. Notice what it says in verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three and a six years and six months, it did not rain on the land. That tells me Elijah was righteous in God's eyes. Righteous people need to pray. Well, how can I be righteous, Paul? Well, first off, you need to be saved. Then you're not going to be righteous without taking that step, without having Jesus Christ save your soul and wash your sins away and have the Holy Spirit baptize you in that moment. You're never going to have effective prayers. How many times have we been told and we have told you that God is not obligated to hear your prayers if you're lost? How many people are supposedly praying today to God and they don't know him, have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior? God is not obligated to hear their prayers. He's not. But if God has saved your soul and you come to him in his will and you pray, God has obligated himself to hear you. Now, you may not get the exact answer you pray for, but God's will will be done. And I believe, I believe, for us to have effective prayers, we need to pray when we pray for God to show us his will. God, what is your will in this situation? What is your will? What is, are you trying to do? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to reveal to me in this moment. We're, you know, we're to confess our sins to each other and pray for one another to be healed. That means spiritually forgiven. And then we can pray for the, the sick who are physically sick to be healed too. Remember again, go back to righteous people praying. Now, I know our church has been hurt and I know many churches have been hurt over the last year especially. A lot of things going on. 
And we can, we can easily, easily allow Satan the ground. Give him the ground to say, well, the reason why those people you love died is because you're not righteous and God didn't hear your prayer. Now, I'm not going to say in some cases that wasn't a fact, but I don't believe it was in every case. I don't believe it was in many of the cases we've experienced in our church either. I believe we've had righteous people praying for God to heal our loved ones. And God, as much as we don't want to hear it, has said no. Ah, we don't like to hear the word no. But when we submit ourselves, submit ourselves to the will of God, when we come to his throne intimately before him, as a little child, we pray to him. God will show us his will. God will show us what he's doing. God, has show, God will show us why we've had to go through this valley that we've had to go through. God will reveal it to us. And I believe, every, I believe every valley that we see the saints in the Old Testament and the New Testament go through, and we see it in our people's lives, our church's lives, our family's lives, every valley that we have gone through, that God has brought us through that valley, we have come out stronger on the other side. I fully believe that. They may be deep, dark valleys. They may be dry. I mean dry. Imagine three and a half years of no rain. Elijah prayed and it rained. But you know what? Between verse 17 and 18, something else happened. Between 17 and 18, something else happened. Elijah prayed in verse 17 for it not to rain for three and a half years. It did not rain for three and a half years. Then at the end of that three and a half years, God told Elijah to present himself to Ahab, and he did, and he called the people together, and Elijah said, okay, look here, it's not rain for three and a half years. Today, decide on who's God. If God be God, then let him be God. If Baal be God, then let him be God. The people agree, let's do it. Let's show off today, who's boss? Prophets of Baal prayed all day long, no answer came. They cut themselves, they danced around, they did all this uh, stupid stuff that we see the world do today, and no answer came because their God wasn't real. Elijah, though, humbled himself before God, built an altar there, laid the sacrifice on it, and called out to God to answer. And God answered. God showed the people of God and the Israelites who truly was God. And then it rained. Then it rained. The people repented of their sins, and then it rained. Do you see how that worked? Effective prayer. God is the one who held back and then sent the rain for Elijah. God's the one who held back the rain, and then God's the one who sent it for Elijah. Now, now get this, we're coming to a close. God will be the one to answer our prayer. Not us. I can't answer your prayers. You can tell me to pray, I can't answer them for you. God's the one who's going to answer our prayers. So we have to go to Him. We have to get in His presence and have His will be done. There's a reason to pray. Jesus did it. If the Son of God took time to pray, should we not have the same desire to pray to him? Should we not? The practice of prayer. Jesus got away. Jesus got away from the crowds. Oh, man. Oh, man. Some, some, some people today, oh, to have the crowds that Jesus had following him around. Oh, man. Look what I have done. I got all these people following me. I ain't leaving them one moment. No. Jesus got away from them. To do what? To pray. Father, not my will be done, but yours. Your will be done. Effective prayer. Effective prayer. Prayer of faith will save the sick person 
and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. I want to tell you today, there are people in our church praying for others today. They are praying for them to be healed physically. They are praying, more importantly, for some to be healed spiritually. I want you to know you're being prayed for. I want you to know that somebody loves you that's taking time out of their day to go to God on your behalf. Don't waste their time. Don't waste their time because time is precious. Time is swiftly passing by all of us. If you know someone's praying for you, you better tell them thank you. You better tell them thank you because they're going to God on your behalf. Don't waste their efforts. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for your word. God, help us to pray. Help us to practice praying daily. Not just once a week. Well, it's, it's, it's the day to pray. Today's the day to pray. Sunday. No. God, if we only wait until Sunday to pray to you, man, we have, we've, we're, we're just, we're in a desert. <laughs> we're in a drought. Father, help us to communicate with you in an intimate way where that it's just me and you, us and you, and that we give you everything. You already know, but we give you everything. May you reveal your will to us, Father, and may you strengthen us to be a light. If we've got sins in our lives, help us to confess them to you and to seek forgiveness. You'll forgive us. I know you will. Your word says you will. Father, I pray for those who are here that may be lost, those who may need to come back, those who need encouragement, those who need strength, those who just need a little help along the way. God, may you meet those needs today. Your will be done. Your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Jan, come.